Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting edition of Victory Never Sleeps. Um, just a forewarning to you guys, I'm going to do my best, but uh, my chest and throat are killing me. So Mandy's going to bring me some tea, and uh, we're going to we're going to push on through. But uh, if my voice starts getting wonky, or if I'm coughing a bunch, that is that is the reason. Um, any business at the top of the hour since last time I saw you or I, last time I spoke to you, rather, we had midsummer, well, we've had midsummer in a lot of places around the country, but I was able to go to midsummer at Odin's off in uh, Brownsville, California. And it was a amazing event. It was really, really nice this year. The whole attitude and the vibe was wonderful. The rituals were powerful met some amazing folks that it was their first time out to the Hoff. It was a really nice event. If I saw you there, then you know what I'm talking about. If I didn't, I would love to see you there for midsummer next year. Um, other things to let you be aware of next month, July the 22nd, we're going to have Sigur Bloat at Sigurheim. Be forewarned, it's going to be kind of rustic. Uh, some folks will probably camp out the night before, maybe even that night. Um, we're going to get some kind of porta potty situation set up. We hope we have some water uh, happening by then, but if we do not, then we will truck in bottles of water. Water will be available. Um, we'll have some tents set up, uh, some like party pavilion tents set up. Idea being uh, one set up down where we have, where we will have the hall in the future, and the other set up on top of the ridge where we plan on putting tears off. So that'll give kind of a spatial understanding of where stuff's going. And uh, it's an amazing place. It's a beautiful place. And I hope everybody who is able can uh, meet me there and celebrate with me. Um, Yes, yeah, the next uh, two months, and then in August, we will be celebrating Freyfaxi at Baldershoff, and uh, that that's Baldershoff's yearly event. It's going to be awesome. I look forward to going out there every time. Our guest tonight is uh, is from there and regularly leads things there at that Hof and takes care of it, so he knows how special it is. If you guys can make it there, that's in Murdoch, Minnesota. We would love to see you. Um, if you can't make it there, endeavor to find a way to make it there at some point. Uh, it's not going anywhere. And if you're interested, if you're not an AFA member, please contact your local folk builder and they can get you all set up. Um, without further ado, I'm going to toss it over to our special guest tonight, folk builder Nathan Erlinson. And he is going to tell all of us what he knows about Sven Bjorn Bientensen. And for the purposes of this, let's just assume that nobody's ever heard of Sven Bjorn before. And uh, tell, tell, tell folks what they need to know. All right, absolutely. Sven Bjorn Bientensen, he was a pioneer in Iceland as far as the Asa True Faith is concerned. Um, he was in the 70s um, a man, a farmer, sheep farmer specifically, who came from a very talented family of farmers, but also poets. Um, and in the 70s, it was finally had been legal for some time for folks to leave the church. And he implemented um, a push for Asatru to be recognized as a national religion over there, um, and which it didn't come easy initially, but through uh, dedication, he eventually, him and a few others, were able to get that recognized. Sven Bjorn was born on April 4th, 1924 in Iceland, died the 24th of December, 1993, and like I was saying, in 1972, he founded the group called Asatru Urfelag, the Icelandic heathen organization, where he was the chief Gothi to the day he died in 1993. Uh, his beliefs, after lots of hard work, were officially recognized by the Icelandic government as a religion 
in May of 1993. So just before he died, um, he was fortunate to see the fruits of his labors pay off after 20 some years of practice. Seven months before he died, uh, it finally became recognized. As I was saying, he belonged to a family of farmers. He himself was a farmer, and since early childhood, he had a close connection with the gods of the Norse pantheon. At 16, he started writing his own poems about the Norse gods, inspired by the sagas that were written down. And as most of us know, the Icelandic people were very tied to the Norse beliefs. And when the Christian faith started to spread all over the continent, the religion was forbidden. Illegal, but not lost. Hey, Nathan, your your audio is pretty rough. We missed about the last sentence and a half. Okay. Maybe I'll just speak up. Much better. Icelandic people are very tied to the Norse beliefs, as most of us know, and some, some of you may just be learning, uh, before Christianity came. And when the Christian faith started to spread all over the continent, the religion was forbidden, illegal, but not lost. And for the next 970 years, people still worshipped the gods, hiding that from the eyes of the church because they feared it. Only after 1874, people had the right of religious freedom of choice. And so they, whoever wanted, could leave the church finally. In the 70s, Iceland lost many devotees of the Christian faith and started to spread again its original faith. In these times, it was in these times that Sveinbjörn founded the heathen group called Ostrularfelag, a group that still believed and worshipped the gods and also the land spirits of the area. Sveinbjörn and the people of his group were also true. They believed in the Asir gods. It was the most important Norse pantheon to them. As you may know, the Norse gods are divided into groups, but Sveinbjörn's group was focused only in the Asir, an important step to the future generations who wanted to learn more about their history, the old religion, and the beliefs, and also wanted to be connected with the land, which was in fact one of the main purposes of Sveinbjörn's group to be in contact with the land spirits and the spirits of their ancestors. Sveinbjörn was a great figure who helped bring a lot of Norse beliefs back to our culture, back to our people. They have always been there, but hidden because people feared the power of the church and the Christian faith. But Sveinbjörn stimulated the awakening of these beliefs and people now feel lighter and free to be what they are, choose the spiritual path that they are original to. Uh, one of the many things that we are fortunate to have um, in regards to Alshir Yargothi Sveinbjörn is shortly before his death, um, there were a couple of interviews performed uh, or done in Iceland with him and a couple of translators that he was close with. And Nick has a link that he can put up if anybody's interested in looking at these conversations. Um, they're very informative. Um, I'm just gonna read one of the questions here real quick. Um, that is a common question among our people, our folk. And the woman that was interviewing him, she asked a question. I would like to know some more of the reading that one could pursue to learn the basis of Asatru. I know that there are some things available to people in the United States so that one could get an idea of the background of Asadru. Sveinbjörn responds, there are, of course, a number of scientific treatises on the history of Asadru available in the English language, but this is more of a historical than a religious nature available. Both the prose Edda and the poetic Edda are the main source for how our ancestors received the gods and nature. And this is actually best to go back to the source. One should go to some of the Icelandic sagas, which are available in the English translation, where it is possible to see how this religion affected those who confessed it. This would be a more real experience than reading a scientific or historical treatment of the subject. If you read this with an open mind and concentrate to interpret according to your own society and environment, you cannot go very much wrong. 
and this interview goes on uh, pages and pages and pages. Um, a very good resource to get into um, the mindset of the El Shiryar Gothi um, back shortly before his death in 93. Um, to sum it up, he was he was a pioneer uh, for Asatru, um, one of the first recognized El Shiryar Gothis in 970 plus years um, and held afloat for the first time in Iceland in about that same time period. Uh, the other thing that he was most notably known for was his reunion, his music um, that he recorded, sang, and his poetry. And like I said at the beginning, his brothers and sisters, very, very talented poets, turns out to be, even though they started out on a sheep farm. And so you can, by searching him pretty easily, find recordings of this great man's. But wait, while we're on that, I've asked Nick to queue up. Um, and I'm told this is appropriate with fair use and everything. Just a just a snippet of Svein Bjorn doing some of his reamer, and he's doing a, a section out of the Havamal, reciting it in in reamer form. Nick, do we have that ready? Gandhi sinni skilet maður hæsin vera, heldur gætin að geði. Þá er horskur og þögull kemur heimis garða til, sjaldan verður víti vörum. Því að óbrigra vinn fær maður aldrei en mann vitt mikið. Veistu ef þú... Vinn áttu þann er þú vel trúir og vilt þú af honum gott geta. Geði skaltu við þann blanda og gjöfum skipta, bara að finna oft. Ungur var ég fórn. All right. Um... Yes, yeah, so we've lost our uh, our guest host here for a minute. I'm sure he's getting back uh, back sorted out, but it's really special. Um, I think one of the challenges with our heroes is being able to connect with them and see them as real people. Um, I think that's something that's very it's much easier done with people whose lifetime overlapped ours, but it's much more difficult when we have someone like last month, like a Thanarik who, who lived, you know, 1700 years ago. But each of these people are real, real men and women who did real things. And I think as far as I know, and I'm not sure if there's any audio of, of Stoba or of, of Elsie out there, but as far as I'm aware of, this is the only one of our heroes that we have the opportunity to actually listen to his voice. Um, and I think that's that's something special. Svan and I have talked on here many times about the magic of, of voice, of incantation. And certainly when he is chanting and, and musically, lyrically reading our, uh, our lore in that cadence, it's really something special. It kind of sends chills up your spine. At least it does mine. Didn't mean to interrupt you there, Nate. Uh, you are back. What What else do you have for us on Svein Bjorn? That uh, pretty much sums it up. Um, one interesting story I did find is the first time he went to their uh, parliament of sorts, or what you would call it over there, to request also true to be acknowledged um they were simply more or less turned away um in a little bit of contempt and told it would be considered um turns out it's recorded that no less than 20 minutes after they left uh lightning struck 
that building. And for anybody that knows in that environment up in Iceland, lightning, thunder is very rare. Um, and then within a very relatively short period of time, that Osetru was recognized then at that point because everybody knew about that lightning strike at that building and that uh, it was attributed to Thor. And then after that, it's, uh, yeah, it was just marching forward and it blew up in Iceland. They started their first bloat with maybe 50 people. Um, and then it increased in magnitude exponentially after that, um, year by year, season by season. That's a very special thing and uh, something we have rarely attested to amongst our heroes is such an overt blessing shown by our gods. Um, that's one of the reasons, and, and there's a number of just merit reasons for this man to be considered one of our heroes. One of the most compelling things that we had to do this and we had to honor him as a hero is if, if Thor himself is acknowledging his efforts and something he's trying to do that speaks volumes and, uh, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I don't know, it's it's different. Like I say, our heroes go over, you know, the, the millennia. And I think that someone who did live so close to us is easier in a lot of ways to relate to, um, more tangible for the people who are listening. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's a, that's a good story. Um, good start on talking about him. Anybody who has questions, please feel free to ask. Um, we are still working on some MeWe stuff, but we've got it rigged to where Nick's getting me y'all's questions. Um, I forgot to do this at the top of the show, but we are live on uh, Odyssey, VK, Twitter, entropy and youtube so i hope you know tell your friends to join us any of those places if those are their preferred platform and also on fridays this is always uploaded on spotify as a podcast to listen to later um, if you want to donate or contribute or you know get your uh, get your question to the front of the line that's something you can do over on entropy <coughs> and without further ado i will get to first questions here. All right. So, um, Woodcutter NPC, how many members does the AFA have? And is there a map that shows how many members each state has? Not exact location, but in each state roughly. So first we've got um, 947 members as of this moment. As far as a map that shows that, no, not on your end. So internally, for internal use, we have a really amazing Google map that plots all our members all over, all over the world. But it is very exact on addresses, and so it's not something that we publish out there publicly. Um, as far as a, a stripped down version that just kind of graphically shows the states and how many in each state, uh, we do not currently that we have to share out. One of our folk builders, uh, Timmy Dumas, used to make up one of those for us pretty regularly. Um, internally with the folk builders, I do something similar. I run a report in our database to you know see the um, membership by state, so we can see you know how many in each state, like you're asking. But we don't really have that put out graphically. If that's something people are interested to see, I'm sure that's something we can we can mock up, but we don't have that available right now. Um, <clears throat> next question is from Ali. Which uh, this one's for you, Nate? Which virtues would you say that Svein Bjorn embodied most? 
Uh, being a farmer with no electricity and didn't have phone till much, much later, uh, self-reliance is one uh, that I would say he embodied the most. Um, he knew from a young age um, and connected with the sagas at a young age and never looked back and pushed to make that become a reality, um, also true being reborn again in Iceland. I think that's something really important for everybody to consider. Um, and, and again, it's kind of a perennial thing we talk about on this program, but <clears throat> the hardest thing to do is to go from nothing to something. Once you have momentum behind you, everything becomes so much, so much easier. But uh, many of our heroes, um, specifically Svenbjorn, uh, Elsie, Alexander Rudd Mills, these people, as well as our founder, Stephen McNallan, they were that first generation of, hey, I have an idea. I have something that I want to see happen, something I feel compelled must happen for our gods. And going out there into the world and doing that by yourself, building this from the ground up by yourself, and, you know, attracting a few friends along the way, that is such, that takes so much willpower. And like, like Nathan points out, so much perseverance. You have to make it through all the times where it seems like nobody else cares, where people look at you funny, or other people don't take you seriously, or realize why you take this so seriously. These people were truly, truly pioneers of what we all love so dearly today. And, uh, you know, all of the things that we have are because these heroes of our folk went out there and spent their lifetime building something out of nothing. And that's uh, that's an amazing, amazing thing that I think it's very easy to take it, uh, take for granted, and not appreciate as much as we should. Again, our question system is a little bit clunky. Uh, I appreciate y'all bearing with me and cutting me a little slack on it. Uh, next question is also from Ali. Would the AFA at some point in the future have interest in developing an English language song version of the Have Em All? <coughs> sure. Uh, that's one of those, you know, all we would let. I saw over in the comments, you know, wanting to hear Svan do that in Icelandic because he is a native Icelander. Um, yeah, any and all of that. We have far too little art in Ausatru at this stage. And it's something we'd really love to see. And that includes poetry and music, as well as the visual arts. Um, I think it would be cool. I, I, just listening to that kind of inspires me to want to learn a little bit more about Raymer myself. Um, I don't know if the cadence fits or just how that works to translate over to English, but I think that would be you know, something really beautiful to listen to and something we'd absolutely love to see happen. Oh, on as a side note, I didn't want to interrupt uh, Nathan earlier, but <coughs> Monk, I saw your comment about your close call on your motorcycle, and I'm really glad that worked out well for you. I appreciate the opportunity. That was the first bike blessing I'd ever done for you and your friend. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that was helpful to you in, in your time of need there. And either way, I'm really glad that uh, that you made it through that safe. It was nice to meet your friend this weekend and great to have you guys both out to midsummer. Um, next question is for you. Nathan, what was one of your favorite bloats and where was it? A favorite bloat. And I'll tell you what, not much comes close to and Odin bloat at Odin's off. Um, yeah, hands down, uh, favorite bloat I've attended would be the Odin's bloat at Odin's off done by R.L. Shiryar Gothi. Well, thank you for that, Nate. I always try really hard on that. It's going to any of our Hoffs and being able to give bloat to that God at his specific Hoff 
is such a such a special thing that you know none of the modern heroes that we talk about have been able to do we live in a time where that's available to us and it's it's such a blessing to be be able to do that um yeah i think we had a really good odin bloat this weekend as well it seemed auspicious it felt really powerful it's the start of whatever's going on with my throat so i tried to try to knock it out the park i hope it did all right i'm uh, i'm still paying for the sacrifice on that one right now um our next question um, from Real Madrid fan. When lightning strikes something, do you think that's a sign from the gods? What are your thoughts, Nathan? I guess that depends on context entirely. Um, our faith are chosen for us. Um, all but how we decide to act in the interim anyway. And so when something like that happens, it's magnitude and it's direction is has, has to be acknowledged. Um, they say lightning doesn't strike twice in the same spot. Well, we, we know that that's not true. Um, but again, pay attention to things like that. Um, obviously not every lightning strike you see is going to have meaning behind it as far as we can tell ourselves. Um, but who are we to say that it doesn't either? I guess that would be my take on it. Context is everything in those kind of circumstances. <clears throat> do I think every lightning strike is a sign? No. Do I think every time lightning strikes, you know, a building or is observed by people, is that a sign? No, probably not. But the key is the discernment on these things, being able to determine when something is special and when something is, is mundane. And it's, it's an art form and you're not always going to get it right. But, for example, the lightning strike that we spoke about earlier in reference to Svenbjorn, it happened, so, and these are kind of things that I look at to evaluate whether I think something was, you know, a sign or whether it was just something that happened at random. <coughs> it happened at a very specific time. It happened in a place where thunder and lightning ha happened very, very rarely so to happen in a very specific way at a very specific time involving a decision about our faith specifically for a man who was inspired by Asa Thor, I think all of those things coming together with the timing of it make it very auspicious and obvious to my eyes as being a sign of, of divine recognition and divine action. <coughs> But like I said, context is everything. Um, we get this a lot with animal sign. Animal sign is one of the big things that people notice. Um, and and take, uh, take things away from it. Very often when people see ravens, it's very meaningful to them every single time. Well, I grew up in Alaska and there's ravens everywhere all the time around every dumpster in the winter. So every time you see ravens, it's not the all father speaking to you. Sometimes it is, oftentimes it might be. And figuring out what, figuring out when something feels different, when certain things are aligned, when there's a synchronicity, that is a challenging thing, but that is one of the big keys to maximizing your, your luck, your destiny. One of the big, um, themes in Ausatru is the Rivo rune. It's the rune of our priesthood, and it means right action at the right time. And <clears throat> by acting rightly, you pull things towards you. But you've got to know and you've got to recognize when synchronicities occur, and you've got to be able to recognize opportunities and capitalize on them. And that's, you know, that that's 
so much easier said than done, but the better you're able to do that, the more you can maximize your potential in your life. So looking for signs and being open to that is valuable. And the next step of being able to view that with discernment is, is even more so. Oh, a bunch of questions just came in. All right. Next question um, from Ryan O'Brien. From my understanding, his group became woke and multiculti. Has the AFA reached out to those members to see if they want to genuinely honor our ancestral gods and ancestors? It's a very good question. Um, in your research into Svenbjorn, did you look into what's happened with the Austria Felig since his time? Nathan? I did not. Um, uh, no, I guess simple answer there. I did not look no, into what they've been doing lately. Um, I was generally focused more on the man himself for the hero purposes. So they're, uh, you're absolutely right. They become super woke and super multiculti and really not an organization that um, we share much in common with or want to celebrate. <clears throat> But as far as I can tell, most of those things in the overt way happened after uh, Svenbjorn's time. Um, we have interacted with some Icelanders that were involved or at least were aware of that of that their group and tried to join the AFA for a time. Um, but that's been very few and far between. We haven't had any kind of contact with them. Um, the, the troth and other leftist, um, quote unquote, also true outlets here in back in the nineties, at some point brought over Sven Bjorn's successor and tried to utilize him for political purposes and get him to condemn the AFA and, I think a couple of other groups as being, you know, evil racists or, or whatever. And so that was kind of a misuse of that. But that's the last big interaction between U.S. Alcatru and uh, Icelandic Alcatru that I'm aware of. Um, like I said, as it's evolved, there's not a lot in common. It's uh, since it's become a state religion over there or one of the options for state religion. What happens often, I'm told, is that there's a, there's a church tax. And I think this happens in many European countries to where a portion of your taxes go to a church. For the longest time, it was, um, <clears throat> I believe the Lutherans that it would go to in Iceland. But recently, since, as Nathan talked about, since your ability to leave the state church and they recognize some other churches, you can specify where that tax dollar goes. And so one of the things that atheists and people who were non-religious generally had to put their money somewhere, and this was a, I don't know, fun, whimsical place to put your money if you don't want it to go supporting the Lutheran church. And that's been a source of a lot of their membership. Another thing that folks were doing is homosexuals were using it as a place to get married because the Austria Felegeth uh, would recognize and perform homosexual weddings, whereas the Lutheran church would not. So it kind of became a, uh, a pool for all the people who didn't want to share any sort of Christian values or have their money go towards that more than it was a group of people who actively wanted to worship the ICR. And certainly I can't say that about every member of that organization and, and i wouldn't try to but that seemed that's a theme that's been going on at least since uh the early 2000s perhaps more than that i'm not really an expert on it <clears throat> but yeah if anybody had connections and wanted to offer those people an opportunity to experience also true and uh what we feel is a much more authentic way we would 
be really happy to have that conversation. One second, I got to pull up our quest our questions each time here. Um, uh, also, by Ryan O'Ryan, do you think the AFA should publish its own poetic edda, one that doesn't hide or mistranslate folkish passages? <coughs> I think in general, it would be nice to have um, our lore produced in-house. Um, that way we could add commentary and have, you know, special um, tonight's rough guys. I apologize. Append appendices at the end of it with different things that we think are useful and we can package it the way we'd like. Doing a full trans retranslation, I think, is kind of beyond our scope. Um, I would be very open to that. And if we had any members that were linguists that could do that, um, going back to the source retranslation, I'd be very curious what that turns up and what we would find different than the existent translations. And I'd be very, very open to that. We just don't have anybody right now with that specialty that I'm aware of. Well, because there's so many, there's countless translations of that material. Um, and so each translator is going to have their own take on it. And it's always up for debate who's <coughs> wrong. And that's one thing you'll find when you're looking for source material is there's countless translations out there. Um, I think that that's a great goal for us to have as uh, a church is to one day maybe be able to do that. That would be fantastic. Absolutely, it would. Um, Allie asks, you both do so much for our folk. What inspires you to uh, persevere and seek victory? Nathan, what what inspires you to keep, keep on trucking until we're victorious? Um, well, I guess I ask myself what the alternative is to victory. Um, and I don't have a comprehension for giving up, quitting, surrendering. Um, I do acknowledge that some <clears throat> battles you lose um, and some battles you win, but the ultimate goal is to win the war. And for me, with my background, that's kind of how I was brought up as a man anyway and that was as an infantry soldier and that's carried over to still today and so when i approach the austin troop folk assembly i am working towards victory in everything that i do you know i so many things inspire me to persevere and pursue victory um <clears throat> Certainly the gods themselves. It's one of those, um, it's one of those things. Once you experience the reality of the gods in your life, uh, you can't go back, or I certainly couldn't ever go back to not realizing that and not feeling that and not knowing that that's there. Um, knowing that the gods are real, they're our gods, they're my gods and feeling them work in my life and in ways that that affect my family and I I owe them so much how could I not do my best to achieve victory for them to build things for them to make hoffs for them and to bring people home to them uh, my love of my my folk absolutely my love of my family one of the most amazing things and you guys have heard me on and on about this on here is Building this for my daughter and for my descendants after her, um, just looking at how far we've come from when I started to the world she was born into, where she was born into a world with, well, she was born into a world with one Hoff, but her the year of her birth, we got the next two. Um she's grown up. There's never going to be a time in her life. There's not temples to our gods. And that's an amazing thing. Seeing how far we've come in that time certainly inspires me to wonder what, you know, how far could we come by the time of my grandchildren 
and I want to I want to do my best to get us as far ahead and uh, to build as great a legacy for them as I can. The other thing <clears throat> that really inspires me on a personal level. I, I am deeply, deeply committed to trying to do everything I can to do this job the best that I can. Uh, I feel this is, you know, this is my purpose in life is to do this and do this as well as I can possibly do. Any times that I fall short of that are devastating. Um, and the way that I cope with stress or anything else in life is to try to throw myself at this as hard as I can to move closer and closer to victory, to win more for our folk and our gods, and to be worthy of being all Harrier Gothi. And uh, it's something I don't ever want to slack in. I don't want to ever let up in. It's, you know, this is why I named the show Victory Never Sleeps is you've got to stay, <clears throat> you got to stay on your toes and you can't rest on past successes. Every day is a new opportunity to win for us and for our gods. And uh, throwing myself into that as hard as I can is what, uh, what stills any kind of stress or doubt or uncomfortableness in my life. And we talk about this uh, as far as righting wrongs or building, building reputation or making things right. And one of the things in our faith is stuff, just bad things don't disappear, but you outweigh them with good things. I want to outrun all of the ways that, you know, all of the things that that I'm not perfect at, all of the things that I mess up at, any of the things in my life that aren't perfect can't undo, but all I can do is run forward as hard as I can to do more, to build more and to make more happen. And uh, that brings me a certain amount of inner peace that uh, inspires me to always keep moving and trying to build that, uh, build that Hamenia as mighty as I can. It's kind of a long answer to a question that maybe wasn't meant that long. <clears throat> uh, Rachel asks, can you speak on the schedule of events for Sigur Bloat and elaborate on the victory games? Um, yes, because <laughs> Wouldn't you know, attached to this question, Nick gave me the current schedule of events. Uh, this may be the first time I've seen these events. So this is not this is not gospel. This is this is just what it's looking like right now. We want to have an early breakfast at like 9 a.m. is what we've got on the schedule at present. Uh, 10 a.m. We're doing a welcoming of the gods. <clears throat> 1030, an ancestors ceremony. 11 o'clock, a discussion with me uh, on the progress and future goals of Sigurheim. 1230, we're looking at doing lunch. 1330, ah, he did it in military time. I see what he did there. 130, we'll be doing uh, the Tournament of Victory with and Children Activities um, at, I'm not going to math, 330, we'll be doing Victory Games. We'll be crowning the award winner of the Victory Games. Now, so in the victory games, that's been kind of out of my hands. It's something that other people have been developing and, and getting uh, implements for. Uh, the idea in concept was for it to be a bit more serious than some of our, our more fun Viking games at events with a little bit more, I don't know, a little bit more serious about scoring and, and athletic prowess as opposed to just having a good time. Ideally, we'll do both. But I think that was the original concept. Um, Nick could probably direct you on who best to talk about, about some specifics on victory games, though, as well. Um, then after that, at uh, five, we're looking at doing bloat. Dinner at 630. Auction at 730. Sumble at 830. I'm sure people will be hanging out, but it's important to keep in mind we have neighbors there. 
We don't want to be bad neighbors and be up hooting and hollering and yelling in the middle of the night. We want to be respectful of the people that live around us there. Um, we really want to, from, from day one, which <laughs> I guess technically we're a little bit past now because we actually have people living out there. But from as early as we can, we want to be good neighbors and we want to build a good reputation in that community. <coughs> <coughs> Um, our next question is, what kind of lesson can we learn from Svein Bjorn's story? Nathan, what kind of lessons do you think we can learn from the life of this hero? Well, if you look back to where he, how his life was and where he originated from, grew up, um, the challenges he had to overcome at that time with the church in in Europe, um, being a sheep farmer, like I said, with no electricity, never had electricity out there uh, his entire life, had a phone eventually, um, but that was it. And so something I think we can definitely take away from his existence and everything he did for our folk was that no matter no matter the stage as long as you are acting in right action for your folk your gods don't ever give up um perseverance selfless service uh you know freestanding all of that that this man uh, El Shiryar Gothi Sveinbjorn literally started studying the sagas at 16 uh, because they spoke to him. And, you know, that's rare. So something that I definitely, definitely believe that we can take from his existence and everything he accomplished was to fight for right action and what you believe in, uh, especially when it's concerning our gods and our folk. <clears throat> you know, I think it, it goes along with what we were saying earlier on uh, perseverance, but that idea of continuing to try even when it's not the popular thing, even when you may not be in the majority on something, if you know it to be the right thing, continuing to push forward and uh, make what you know is right happen those things you know those things can and do work out it's very easy from the outset to just assume failure or assume it's unlikely and scrap it but uh putting your your whole life behind it and your whole self behind it you can make big things happen one person who's committed one person who has faith in his gods can do amazing things sometimes it's lonely but uh, if you stay the course and stay committed, amazing things can happen. And that official recogni recognition, you know, just a short time before his death is kind of a poignant illustration of that because it took his entire life to make it happen, but it did happen. <clears throat> and pull up next question here. Ah. Uh, all right. This one's for you, Nathan. When did you realize Alsa True was right for you? Uh, great question. Um, so it was, I didn't realize this until it actually happened. But once that spark ignited that flame within me, um, I realized that this is what I had been searching for and doing from a very, very young age. Um, and when I finally realized or, or came to find the information, the names of our gods and our lore and everything like that, everything just, <coughs> <fell into place. coughs> excuse me, everything just fell into place at that time. Um, and ever since then, everything's fallen into place as well, which is a testament to where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be doing 
for our folk and for our gods. Um, so I've been doing this uh, for probably close to six or seven years now um, with the AFA three. And, uh, you know, it's been nothing but energizing the whole time. Absolutely energizing. Um, things, things were rough for a, uh, quite a while for me, um, in which I was, I was looking for this. I was searching for this. I knew what I wanted. I just didn't know what it looked like, if that makes any sense. And when I finally found it, like I said, it just, it ignited <clears throat> a flame within me that has been growing exponentially ever since, um, to where it's become a driving force, um, every day for me, uh, in doing this for my folk and my gods for the AFA. <clears throat> and this was a two part question. First part was just for you. Second parts for us both. But while, while you're on a roll here, what uh, what future AFA goal excites you the most? And do you like the metal? And judging by his hand gesture afterwards, I'm assuming he's talking about music. Absolutely. Um, first future goal, um, what I want to see, I want to see, I want to see my kids do this as adults. That's what that's what I'm doing this for. I want to see Tyr and Rowan grow up in this. I want to see Lily take off with this. I want to see Ashley and I's kids um, live this life. And I'm excited to see what it becomes when, you know, they're adults themselves to see where we're at um, with all the hard work we're all doing. Uh, laying that groundwork and that foundation that had been laid before us um, by our founder and st such, C Stephen McNallan and Sheila. Um, where can we be in 20 years? That's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, yeah. So as far as a specific AFA goal, <coughs> I'm going to cheat and talk about two of them. But in the spirit of your question, which AFA goal am I most excited about? Um, Sigerheim and the development of Sigerheim. I'm kind of obsessed about it. Uh, it's There's so much potential to do really amazing things there, to build a community there and around it, to be able to do this every day. When I first, uh, first became... Yeah, it's not when I first became Austria, I suppose. When I first went to my my very first AFA event was midsummer of 2010. And uh, it it sounds cliche because it's what a lot of people say, but I think it's very real. It changed my life. Um, I went to every other national event I could possibly go to since then. And at every one, every time, I wanted that to be my life. I realized, you know, at that point we had one national event a year that I was spending, you know, 360 days every year so that I could live five days the way it ought to be at, uh, you know, when our folk are together. And my life's gotten so much closer to that. We've got events all over the place. I'm flying out every month to some AFA gathering somewhere. And I'm so blessed to be able to do that. But still not close enough. Sigerheim is that dream where I can live there on property with a Hof, with our great hall, build a community around it and do this every single day of my life with my AFA family. And that's something I'm so excited about. I'm excited about um, building that Hof to, to tier and building that hall and gathering our folk in that hall. But What's probably the most important AFA goal that I'm also extremely excited about is the continued development of our Austro Academy. Um, it's, it's hard because it's not visually as shiny as any of our Hoffs or things like that. So it's hard to give it the attention and the, you know, the pizzazz that it's due. 
But last year we started <coughs> just with kindergartners at first, but something that's going to change the world. We're going to educate our own children and be able to help each other accomplish that so that our kids don't have to suffer the misinformation and the indignities of public school and can be educated side by side with other members of their AFA family, learning together, growing together, and educated in a way that we can be proud of. Um, this next school year, we'll be taking K through third. So that's a huge leap just there. And our folks are very committed to making sure this continues all the way up till we have a full um, K through 12 curriculum. And that's such a big deal. And I say that as the else Harry you go through, but I also say it as a father who is going to homeschool his daughter and has had all kinds of fears and worries. And what if I don't do it right? And how do I comply with state rules on this? And what about this? And what all those things disappeared once we started doing this. And uh, I'm so excited for that with parents. I want everybody to know that's the biggest thing that <clears throat> we're focused on is hand holding because you can do it. This is not an in an unachievable goal. Educating your children through homeschool is something you can do. It's something we will hold your hand through doing and help be a partner in making you successful at doing. And uh, that's that's something I'm extremely excited for. <clears throat> What's next on our list here? Um, what is the current relationship between the AFA and the Asatrua Felagith? <coughs> I mentioned this earlier, but there is none. Um, we have had no, I guess, no official interaction between the two organizations ever in my time, certainly. Um, as I mentioned, there was something called, I think it was an event called the Gathering of the Gothar. And it was a number of, a number of different um, groups, because this was back in the 90s when there was a lot of overlap. Uh, the AFA was much, much smaller. But there was, their, uh, their Alzheimer Gothi at the time was flown over and had some interesting interactions. I think some of it was good. Uh, there was also some, you know, trying to use him as a political prop by um, leftists at the time that were claiming to be practicing house true. But since, like I was going to say, since the, the mid 90s, I don't think there has been any official interaction between the AFA and the house true or fail, I guess. Oh. Um. Um. Next question, which of you are better at Kube? I ha I've never observed Nathan playing Kube, so I don't know. Do, do you bring a strong Kube game? Um, I, I, you know, I've, I've played a handful of times. I guess I'm more of a sniper than I am a grenade thrower, so. All right, so that there's a lack of confidence in the man's coop game. I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm the better coop player, but I would love to test that out next time I see you. Absolutely. Um, so we are we are starting to wind down here. We have two questions left. So if anybody else has got questions, um, let's see them on here. I know that uh, this is kind of a side note for Nick. But I know there's been some questions that I don't see on the end here. So maybe he's got some more to populate for me. Um, how do you guys celebrate Midsummer? I think that <clears throat> context is so much of, of a thing. It depends. Both myself and Nathan got to celebrate Midsummer at Hoff's. Uh, he had, uh, oh, at, well, I say that. I don't know if he did or he didn't. Um, I got to celebrate Midsummer at Odenshof. At Odenshof, we have a tradition. We do our Midsummer bloat outside in, in the Vey space, and we have a permanent sacred circle there we do things in. Um, we have a big Midsummer fire. 
and we pr typically prepare a sun wheel of you know a flammable like made out of wicker sun wheel wreath that people tie ribbons to this year we tied yarn we wove yarn to it and imbue that with with our might with our wishes for the coming year with our our love for balder and then we conduct a balder bloat and during that bloat we'll offer that sun wheel up and burn it as as an offering and do a standard a standard bloat but we do bloat to balder um that's how I celebrated this year. That's how we celebrated Odin's Hof. <coughs> I suppose that's the highlight of the celebration. We actually celebrate it with a three-day event at Odin's Hof where we have, as a prelude to it, we had a Frigga bloat to Baldur's mother. We had a Odin bloat to Baldur's father. And then we did a, a bloat to Baldur himself. Um, Nathan, how did you celebrate Midsummer this year? Very similar. Um, at Baldur's Hof, we had a spectacular midsummer. Um, our setup is a little bit different out here, whereas we don't have the outdoor space to do things like you can at Odin's Hof. However, we do have a spectacular um, indoor venue for our bloats and our ceremonies at that point. Um, but again, Baldur um, you know, was the focus for the weekend. Um, we do a lot of kids stuff as well as I think in our kindred alone, we have, what is it? Seven or eight kids, uh, young kids at that. So everything we do out at Baldersoff usually has to incorporate them at some point in some aspect. Many times it's removed from our main bloats in the Hoff. <coughs> we, for example, we do children's bloats as well um, in conjunction with the uh, main bloats that happen um, just in the basement downstairs in the hall. And so that's how we do it out at Baldershoff um, to make it simple anyway. All right. So. The best. All right. Go ahead, Nate. The best is Hoff, right? Incorrect. Nate? Incorrect. <laughs> no, honestly, I, I feel like a little kid, but we've got four bestest Hoffs. Absolutely. Um, so the next question, what is the AFA's position on psychedelic use for spiritual growth? It's an interesting question. Um, So again, context, context is everything. The AFA in no way encourages any illegal activity anywhere ever. That's not something we encourage anyone to do. So that would leave this to the realm of theory or to, you know, practicing it somewhere in the South American rainforest or perhaps somewhere where it is legal and okay. Um, certainly there's things that can alter your mind, alter your perception and get you in a spiritual space that allows certain spiritual things to happen and, and can better facilitate uh, communication between God's ancestors, anything else for that matter, and you. And that can bypass some of the impediments that people might have. So I think that theoretically, in the theoretical realm, there there's absolutely substance to that. I don't, however, feel that that's necessary to practice House of Truth. Um, and again, the Austria Folk Assembly is not encouraging anyone to do any substance that is illegal to do in your state or country that you find yourself in. What do you got to say on that, Nathan? I think the important part of it all is that you have a solid, solid foundation in the practice and in the beliefs. Um, what you do with that. Um, we can't condone or acknowledge um, if it's illegal because that doesn't happen. Um, just ask Alan. Um, but, uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so that I, I would encourage anybody that were anyone to do those things. I think it's really important that it's done in the right context. 
Um, as with any ritual you pursuit you do involving that or anything else, all the pieces fitting together help make it the best it can be. Um, when we do a bloat, the more you can keep people focused with smell, with sight, with sound, you know, perhaps you use incense or the, the flame of the fire, or even one thing I notice is you come around uh, with the asperging of mead. I smell the mead when it splashes on me. Things that incorporate your senses, your sense of touch, all of those things go into making an experience better or worse. And I think having all those things in place and having people who are not altered there to help you out and to help guide that in a spiritual direction, in theory, would probably be a really good thing to do. With that, too, I mean, just like you said, Matt, it's it's the senses that really make it powerful, um, triggering those senses, the smells, the, the feeling of what's happening around you to where you don't need any type of mind altering drug or chemical or anything like that to get outside of yourself to feel the power of a, 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 a good bloat um that's that's where that's where the, the strength and the power really lies is in the connectivity of your folk around the group um that's around you in a bloat and having everybody in the same mindset on the same page. Whereas if you had somebody that was using some mind altering drugs or something like that, I think it would take away from a bloat personally, um, because they would be experiencing something different. Yeah. Everybody experiences something different, but when everybody's on the same page, the focus is all in the same direction. Whereas you risk using anything mind altering to, losing somebody that's also part of your weird at that point. All right. And so the next question is again, very circumstantial. Um, Mr. Skinner here, what is the correct way to interact with those who are now known hostile to the AFA, but still are personally cordial to myself and my family? Should I, uh, should I just rip the bandaid off? That's entirely up to you. One of the things that I mentioned um, before about recognizing, recognizing signs is the development of discernment. Um, people are grown and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you have to, you know, who you can and can't be friends with. I don't think that's my place to do and I don't think it's appropriate. Um, it has always been my stance as I'll share your Gothi, but before that, um, when I was a folk builder, um, <clears throat> even when I was a regular member, if people were openly hostile to the AFA, then out of loyalty, it was really important to me. I, I would cut those people off. I would stand with the AFA no matter what, because those were my folk and my gods and my people, and that was my team. Um, that was how I handled it doesn't necessarily mean that's how you should handle it. Um, again, those are choices that that each and every person is going to have to make, but there's certainly no edict from the top that the AFA demands you, you know, cut off anybody who, who isn't pro AFA. Um, that's a choice that you've got to make. Do you have any thoughts on that, Nathan? Uh, I, I agree with what you said. Um, it's just you got to have balance. Um, and so if you are interacting and have friendships outside or are hostile to the AFA, um, man, you, you, you're just going to have to watch your step. Um, you got to stay in balance with things and follow, follow your gut, follow your heart. Um, you know, it's either going to work for you or it's not, um, Nobody's going to tell you who you can and can't hang out with and associate with. Um, but, yeah. You know, so I, I will say this. <clears throat> what I think 
what I think the best way to do and what I've done in my life that's helped me a lot is try to develop an existence that all works together. Um, and I know different people are at different stages of this. Some people can't do it or, you know, choose not to whatever, but the more that I've structured my life to where the pieces all fit together, to where my friends are in the AFA and they get along with the other AFA friends that I have, my family is involved with the AFA. All of my life is involved with the AFA. So I don't have this pocket over here that thinks one way and this pocket over here that's different and this pocket over here that's different inevitably to interact in those groups if they don't all function together then you you have to keep up appearances of you know a slightly different person around all these different people around all these different groups i've found it's much much better to make sure my life is harmonious that the people that i interact with i can be proud and who i am that I can do that with my family, that I can do that while I'm, you know, involved in AFA activities, that I can do that when I'm hanging out on the side, that all those things kind of work together. And it's made my life much better to do things that way. Um, it's current AFA membership. Uh, I had mentioned that earlier in the broadcast. It is, let me refresh. Aha. Glad that I did. So it was previously 947. It is now 949. So we've had two new people apply during the course of this program. That's always cool to see. Um, to my knowledge, was Mr. McNallan ever in contact with Svenbjorn? No, to my knowledge, they had no contact. <clears throat> and I've asked that specifically. So forgive me if I'm wrong and I and I mix something up, but no, as far as I know, there's no contact between between Steve and Svein Um Let And so, so the last question I have, but I saw another question on here early. So there's at least two questions here. Um, for Nathan, how do you guys do children's bloats? We've been getting our daughter to join. We have been getting our daughter to join in the bloats. So that's something um, Witt and Callahan actually implemented out here at Baldershoff. Um, we typically do a very low key uh, bloat for the kids. Obviously, it's got to keep their attention. Do a what kind of bloat? Children's bloat. No, you just said a low key bloat. And I, I was making a pun, my fault. Gotcha. Yeah. Keeping the bloat low key. Um, thank you for the correction. See? <laughs> um, no, but that's something that's important. Um, get our children, especially the younger children, used to it. Obviously, the older children can participate in our formal bloats. Um, but having something for the kids to do as well and bringing them up in our practice and our faith, um, we do a uh, children's bloat simultaneously with our formal bloats. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just kept low key um, because they're not going to stand in a circle for very long. And so usually we have a couple of our women folk in leadership that lead that up at the same time as our formal bloat. So as far as including kids and stuff, um, <clears throat> that's also a context thing because it's really different depending upon the kid, depending upon the bloat, depending upon the age. Um, it's one thing we always kind of try to figure out at Odenshoff is you know, what, what to do on that and what to not. Certainly our children are always welcome at all of our bloats, but if they're squirrely and they don't want to be there and they're running around and they're, they're unmanageable, sometimes, you know, it's not right to hamper everybody else's experience 
just have your kid there if your kid is going to be disruptive. So it's a it's a difficult balance. And oftentimes it's our ladies that have to figure it out. I know Mandy brings Aubrey in. Aubrey will be great most of the time. But if she's hasn't had her nap or she's fussy or whatever, then Mandy's got to take her out of the circle and go try to get it figured out. Um, aside from just doing children's bloats, one thing that I have seen work very well with children at Odenshof is just exposing them to it often and giving them the opportunity, starting them out in the bloat. And then if they can't settle down or whatever, then, you know, stepping out with them perhaps, but it being a normal thing that they see, that they see often, that they understand why, and then see them experience it. It's really interesting because especially um, my Odin bloat, but other bloats as well, I'll get very, um, you know, for lack of a better word, I'll get furious with inspiration and I'll be loud and yelling. And it can all be a lot for a kid that's not used to that. But one of the things that I've seen is the more these children have been raised around it, the less, you know, the less scary or the less, you know, sh jarring that is for them. And uh, the more they the more they enjoy it and look forward to it. It's been specifically really fun to watch um, Witten Erickson's kids grow up and take such an active role in things. Um, his son loves to hail Thor every opportunity that he gets. And he's very, very active and he's very inquisitive about our lore and all of the things that we're doing. So, you know, I would say offer the opportunity to your kids, you know, frequently and uh, and really encourage that. And they'll they'll surprise you. Some of the best toasts at Sumble that I can remember were children's toasts. And they just moved me to my core because they were just very simple, but very, very genuine. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's great to have that. Um, Another question, I guess, a question I skipped. Someone in the chat asked, what is Koob? Koob is a lawn game of Norse origin. It's um, trying to think of what it's most similar to. I guess in a way it's similar to like bocce. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, you've got... You've got a certain number of sticks. Your opponent's got a certain number of sticks and you throw them at a central king figure. And there's, I can't go into all the rules right now. It'll make sense when it's there, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a yard game. Very similar to bocce in a lot of ways. Um, I think we got some more questions coming in, but we had a question a while back. And I think because of how we're routing these things, I was the only one who saw it and not Nick due to our entropy interface. So from a Heinlein question, Matt and Nathan, since Sveinbjorn was a bit of a scald, it got me thinking that it's uh, something we lack today. From scaldic poetry to flighting, there are numerous options and paths to pursue, but in your opinions, what ways can we revitalize the poetic nature of our folk within the AFA? Uh, do you have thoughts and ideas on that, Nathan? You know, um, I think it's going to be really come down to um, members uh, just starting to implement that for themselves in their lives uh, initially become become that which is which you speak of and bring it to our events, bring it to our hoffs and um, share it with people, share it with the folk. You know, I think that I'm certainly open to very traditional ancient styles of doing things. I mentioned that earlier with, with Reamer. Um, if someone wants to take up skaldic poetry or traditional, you know, traditional old Norse flightings, um, Cool, that's great, and and I think it's fantastic. I think as far as stuff for us to encourage, though, that tradition can manifest itself in many different ways. Um, I think us encouraging all poetry 
um, us encouraging music generally, I think those are things that can help rebuild that. And I think if we focus over much on trying to make them conform to old Icelandic meter, I think we lose some of the interest. But if we have people who are passionate about music or passionate about poetry, to get them to direct the inspiration for that music and poetry towards our faith, towards our gods, towards our heroes, towards our values, I think that's a really good thing to do. And I want to encourage that at every turn. Um, our last, uh, last question that we have is, a, okay, and again, okay, so last question is, Matt, you've spoken before about how male homosexuality is not welcome within the, in the within the AFA. So it begs the question, is female homosexuality welcome or is it just as bad? I'm asking this because in a previous stream, you talked about how male homosexuality in particular is dangerous for children specifically. Um, no, homosexuality generally in all of its forms is not welcome in the AFA. The differences come outside of that. Um, it's not just as bad. I don't think anything is just as anything. In the AFA, we don't believe in equality. Everything has its own, its own strengths, weaknesses, and place in the hierarchy of things. Um, no two things, no two people, no two actions are equal. Um, <clears throat> so, the difference when I specifically said that about male homosexuality is consensual male homosexuality at any point is kind of a bridge that once you cross, you can't go back. Um, I don't think that's the case with female homosexuality. And I'm not a scientist. I couldn't give you the scientific breakdown, but I think a lot of us just know that that's kind of true. Um, the other thing is you don't or in any of the research I've done, in any of the life experience I've had, I've not seen the direct correlation between female homosexuality and child predation that I have seen with male homosexuality and, and child predation. So I think that they are very different, but I think that male homosexuality is a much greater threat to children. But either way, homosexuality is not uh, not welcome in the Austrian Folk Assembly and is contrary to our values. Um, I think that's all we have tonight. I'm going to check one more time and see if we have any lingering questions. Nope, I think that is it. It's been a short stream tonight, but I'm, I'm a little bit thankful for it because uh, I don't know how much more talking I can do. Uh, Nathan, thank you so much for your presentation on Svenbjorn and for coming back on the program. It's great to have you on here. Hail the folk, hail the AFA, hail the gods. Aha, somebody slipped one in right before the wire. How do you respond to claims that all this modern LGB, LGBT pride stuff was normal in Viking times? One argument I hear people make is comparing Loki to transgenderism. Um, it's ridiculous. Uh, how do I respond to the, the claims that all this nonsense was normal in Viking times? Because it's absurd. It's absurd on the face of it. Um, there's plenty, there is large amounts of evidence that that's not the case at all. Um, one of the big things, it, like just thinking off the top of my head, um, in it, for in the Viking Age thing specifically, the concept of ergi was was terrible and was like a huge, huge, huge insult and a huge so had huge social consequences, and that was basically being the the uh, the female half of a gay couple, I, I guess, <clears throat> or being a man that behaved femininely. There were specific rules on that, like you couldn't cut your shirt a certain way because depending on how you cut um, the top of your shirt would make the difference on whether your garment was a male garment or a female garment. A man that was wearing women's clothes that was extremely frowned upon with a high social consequence for the principle of ergi that I talked before 
Um, we see writings in Tacitus's day of the Germanic tribes stomping homosexuals into bogs because the idea of male homosexuality was equated with their dis disgust of cowardice and other things. Um, no, these people like to make stuff up and it besmirches our ancestors. And it's really unfortunate. Uh, perhaps Loki. And so here's the thing. We also take humor for granted. The idea of Loki turning into a female horse to uh, give birth to Slepnir isn't to Loki's credit, is an illustration of how Loki is an aberration and how he is an element of chaos and something that's repulsive to our gods and our folk. Um, that was never something that was okay or celebrated. It was pointed out as an object of disgust and ridicule. Uh, but no, that's really unfortunate for people to take the voice of the dead and twist it to meet their own political cause. That's not right. And it's very disrespectful, especially when they know that it is not true. Well, that's exactly what it is too. It's their political agendas taking, uh, a very masculine uh, people, history, and folk that took tremendous pride in masculinity and the separation of men and women in their sexuality and using it and trying to twist it for their own agenda and political purposes. Um, and again, as we continue on this, other questions sneak through. So one more last question. Um, I have one more question. Thoughts on the lost continent of Atlantis being the origin of the Aryan tribes. Um, first, Nathan, do you have any thoughts on this? None. All right. So origin of the Aryan tribes. I don't know. I think that's a, that's a reach. We just know too little to prove that or to make that assumption. I will say this, I find the idea of Atlantis fascinating. I find that kind of an ancient archaeology to be very, very interesting. I don't buy all of Graham Hancock's theories, but I think Graham Hancock's work in that kind of field, <clears throat> man, I could listen to and watch that all day long. I think it's fascinating. Um, but no, I don't think we have enough have enough evidence or I have any reason to, to say that uh, in any way Atlantis was the, the original Aryan homeland. Um, I tend to think of that being Hyperborea and put it in an Arctic setting. I think a lot of things attest to that. Um, Arctic home in the Vedas, I think is a really compelling work on that subject. But again, that, that positions it much, much further north and uh, away from where Atlantis is traditionally thought to have been. Um, and that is all we got for tonight. Thank you guys very much for showing up. Thank you as always for your amazing questions. I appreciate you guys. Uh, Nathan, thank you for being on the show. Um, talk to you guys this same time next week. Hail the gods, hail the folk, hail the AFA, and remember, that victory never sleeps. <laughs>